Sometimes it's the smallest boats that make the biggest noise. And in the Oyster range, it's the brand new 495 that's doing just that. But I'll admit from the start, for most of us, 50 foot is not exactly small. Yet she is the new baby of the Oyster fleet. She's also their latest launch. And in fact, they're so proud of her that they've even made a documentary series about her conception and build. So why all the fuss? Well, for starters, the smallest boat in any range is often important as an entry into the brand. And for Oyster, that happens to be 50 foot. But the 495 also represents a number of new steps for the company, both in the design and her construction. In fact, they set up a completely new dedicated facility in Southampton to build this boat. But some things haven't changed. In particular, that the 495 has been created to be just as capable of world cruising as any of her sister ships. Yet the reality is that for many owners, the bulk of their sailing will be holidays and long weekends. So we thought we'd put her to the test on just that, a three-day cruise starting in Hamble and heading to the Channel Islands. But of course, as we all know, boats look rather different at shows than they do in real life. So before we head off, we thought we'd show you what she looks like at her best before we make her just a little untidy. A quick look at the accommodation layout might not reveal anything unusual to start with, but the 495 is a departure from Oyster's norm. The clue is the galley. Rather than being in the passageway aft, it has its own U-shaped space to port. Instead, it's the nav station that occupies the walkway through to the aft cabin. A cabin that's every bit as plush as you'd expect. And includes the Oyster trademark seascape windows. and a cabin that has an ensuite with a shower stall of hotel proportions. In the forward area, there's a twin cabin to starboard. A spacious shared heads to port, and a sumptuous double beyond that. As you'd expect, she's beautifully built throughout. And at this stage in our test, beautifully presented. But it was time to slip lines to find out how she fared in the real world. Our plan was to head from Hamble to the Channel Islands. Not only would this allow us to stretch her legs offshore, but for us South Coasters, a trip across the Channel and back is a popular long weekend family cruise. There's clearly no doubt that the 495 is up to a trip of this type. But instead, one of the key questions is just how easy is it to cruise there and back in a long weekend time frame without feeling under pressure and exhausted on your return? Well, of course, as we all know, in the real world, you can't always leave when you want to. And that's certainly been true for us in that we've had to plug a bit of tide going down the Western Solent. There hasn't been much breeze. So we've been motoring down there because we're very keen to get through the Needles Channel and out into the channel proper, uh, where we'll probably pick up a bit more breeze, we hope. And certainly we'll just get through this adverse tide. But anyway, it's given us a good opportunity to get a first taste of what she's like under engine. And I have to say, it's, it's pretty impressive, actually. We've been plugging along here. We're doing nine knots uh, with an engine revs of 2,300. Effortless, just glides along. Now, admittedly, it's flat water, but even so, effortless progress and really, really quiet. Uh, so very impressed with that. So that's all good. So it looks like you can punch against the tide. The other thing that impressed me this morning was just how easy she is to get off the dock. She's got a bow thruster and a stern thruster, 
and um, it even makes it quite good fun actually you can come off sideways twist the boat around and off you go the only thing that's missing is an audience really and there wasn't one as we passed through Hearst Narrows either which was a shame because the breeze had built we were under sail she looked great and we were keen to show off But as we slipped past the needles, we were out into open water and were ready to settle down. Now on this boat, the furling is quite interesting because we've got a hydraulic furling system on the main and an electric furling system on the headsail. It's a development between Oyster and Selden and it's got a few little interesting extras and one of them is that it's a, a two-speed uh, furling system for both the jib and for the main and it involves holding both buttons in quite clever very clever actually well i'm pleased to say the picture has just been getting better for us as we've headed out into the channel we've now got 13 14 knots true breeze it's pretty much on the beam and we're reaching along under headsail and full main and uh, we're cracking along this boat seems to like sailing at nine knots all the time which is great so that's nice. Now, the other thing that I particularly like is I do like this twin helm system. Now, I've said it many times before, I'm a big fan of this configuration because it's so easy to move through the cockpit and still feel secure. But the other thing that I really like about it is that although the seating is actually here, and that's where you, you probably would spend a bit of time, going upwind, just sitting on the combings here is really comfortable and it's just the right position because you can see the telltales, you can see down the side of the boat, very comfortable, there's an angled um, cockpit sole down here so you don't really need any great foot brace, it's just a natural foot brace here, it's really comfortable, you could definitely spend quite a few hours here, as I'm going to do. Bagging a spot on the helm also meant I didn't have to hoist the kite, not that that was an issue. But no matter how comfortable she is on deck, at some point, you've got to eat. So, interestingly, one of the unforeseen advantages of this crew of five that we've got is that everybody seems to have a similar kind of appetite, which means that the galley is getting quite a lot of use, like every hour and a half. Suits me. But it's, uh, it's interesting, this galley. It, I like this. This is actually a bit of a departure for Oyster in that it's a U-shaped galley, as you can see, whereas normally the galley is in the walkway going through aft. And they're pretty good as well. But I like this because it's very secure. You've got a lot of worktop space really very easily to hand. And it's so secure. You know, you can sit here and, or stand here rather, brace yourself that way, obviously the opposite on the other tack but you can also see around you i can see straight out through the windows down to lewin i can see up to windward and there's even the all-important passing hatch up here for passing up drinks and sandwiches and the rest of it through the window plenty of stowage space loads of lockers loads of drawers obviously oven gimbal oven uh, fridge over here and freezer there's actually an option to have a freezer a bigger freezer on the other side of the boat as well but all in all a very very workable galley so the breeze has dropped a little bit unfortunately we've got the kite up and we're actually doing a bit of motor sailing because we want to keep keep the pace on we want to get to the other side in good time but it's interesting it's a bit of a slop outside kites up we're doing about eight knots boats heeled over but it's perfectly comfortable here it's really uh, good setup Meanwhile, as we maintained our steady pace and some of us tested the sleeping arrangements, the Mars were counting down as the first of the Channel Islands came into view. Well, here we are, look at this. On the west coast of Alderney, just coming down through the Swinge, a narrow passage just out to the west of Alderney, notorious for its strong tides and strong currents. And we're actually going to go round to the south of Alderney and we've found what we think is going to be a beautiful little anchorage around the corner. We're all quite excited about it because given that the prevailing conditions are normally from the southwest, it's not really somewhere that you'd normally anchor. I certainly haven't. 
So I'm looking forward to that. It's a beautiful and stunning place. And a reminder that it is only 75 miles away from Hamble. It's taken us 10 hours to get here. It's been a very effortless crossing. We have had to motor a bit. The breeze wasn't as strong as we'd hoped, but nevertheless, we cruised here in 10 hours and we're looking forward to dropping the hook. Well, sometimes you have to change your plan and sadly that's what we've had to do because gorgeous though it is in there on the south side of Alderney, little bays that I've never seen before and really, really nice. It's not quite the place to spend tonight anyway. So we've decided that uh, we're going to press on, but very pleased that we went in there and had a look. But we always had as a backstop, as an alternative, St Peterport, and that's 13 miles down the track. So we can go down to St Peterport where we know we're going to be able to moor up tonight. So it's been a good trip, it's been interesting, not quite as much wind as we would have liked, but one of the things that comes across really strongly when you spend a bit of time on this boat, and there's five of us on board, is how easy it is to move around and work the boat. We've never felt clutter. We've been up, most of us have been up most of the time, apart from the odd doze, but we've never felt cluttered. And you can move around the cockpit, up and down the saloon, and in the galley, and through this passageway. There are no real pinch points on this boat. So it's into St Peter Port and then uh, tuck up there for the night. And then tomorrow the plan is to go and have a little cruise around some of the islands that lie just outside St Peter Port. Um, Sark, Jetto, all around there. I love it around there. Can't wait. Well, St Peter Port is absolutely beautiful, of course. I've been here many times before and it's a great place to come to. But when you've got 15, 16 knots and some sunshine and a beautiful flat sea state, you've just got to come and play. And we're off to Sark. Put her on the wind and there are several things you notice straight away. Good sails tight sheeting angles and a carbon rig that takes plenty of backstay pressure to help you get an enviable straight luff. All of which makes her a great boat upwind. But what about in a chop? Further out in the big rustle the tide was running against the breeze, stirring up the sea state. And the answer came quickly. Easy. To me, there's no doubt that the performance of modern oysters has improved with each generation, and the 495 continues that trend. And there's one surefire way of assessing that. When the autopilot barely gets a look in, you know you've got a good boat on your hands. Now, at some point, we had to stop charging around and sailing around like hooligans out there and come and actually have a look at some of the detail aboard the 495. And it's a very interesting boat. A lot of the details, if you've followed Oyster's progress over the last few years, will be quite familiar. But there's some interesting developments. But just quickly, starting at the front, of course, nowadays you've got to have a fixed bowsprit. This boat's no different. Interestingly, you can deploy the anchor from the helm station at the back. And whilst you can't, it's more difficult to see the chain going out, it's still pretty handy. And we did it twice here. And it was a pretty handy little trick. One of the things that I do really like, and I know I've gone on about this before, is having a nice sail locker up forwards, which is great. It's a really deep sail locker. We've got a great big kite in there, and there's still plenty of room for fenders and warps and mooring lines and all kinds of things. So that definitely gets a thumbs up from me, because I like that a lot. Now, when it comes to the bigger picture, certainly at the front end of the boat, one of the things that's absolutely unmissable is that it's just such a clean and uncluttered foredeck, which is tremendous. You can still put dorades in and the guards over the top, but we've got it nice and clean and it's superb. Lovely, great big space. Very much like some of her sister ships. And indeed, like her sister ships, 
She's got a non-overlapping headsail with tracks here, which makes her a very, very easy boat to handle. One thing that did definitely catch my eye, both when I first saw her at St. Catherine Docks in London on her first display, and of course here, is that this is a carbon fiber mast. It's an optional extra, and if she were mine, that would be uh, an option that I'd be considering very seriously. It's quite expensive, but in my mind, it's definitely worth having. Right, moving back a little bit further. This is all pretty familiar. Chain plates out on the gunnel, big spreaders. It also means you've got these nice, big, wide side decks. Again, we've seen that on other models, but this is no different. The two helm stations, well, we talked a little bit about that. I really like those. It works extremely well. And I guess, I suppose with this boat, it, it's not new to see this configuration, the 565, the 595, and indeed the bigger boats have all got that. But I guess what impresses me is that the smaller the boats get, the more difficult it gets to make this configuration work because you still need to have the headroom down below. But this one definitely works. And one of my datums is that I've done a lot of sailing on the Oyster 54. A good friend of mine's got one. I've spent years sailing it and I can't help comparing the two. And whilst I love the 54, this configuration in a boat that is four foot smaller is definitely a step up. There's no question in my mind about that. Some people do question whether you might feel a bit exposed here and I can see their point. I wondered it myself. That is not the experience that we've had so far. And we've been doing some upwind sailing today and we've been on the boat for a few days now. You just don't feel exposed. Quite the opposite actually. Very secure, lovely place to sit, very easy to get to all the controls. Big thumbs up all around from my point of view. So, moving further back, interesting main sheet system on this boat. The standard is a two to one system that goes back up into the, into the boom. But this boat actually has a magic ram inside and it's a, as you can see, a single part main sheet system, it goes up through a set of rollers, it's fixed at the bottom and it goes on to a hydraulic ram inside, which is on a reverse purchase. So it gives, in other words, as you move the ram, it gives more throw on the rope than the ram actually gives. So you can get the full sweep of the main sheet going in and out with just one hydraulic ram inside the boom. And it works extremely well. It's incredibly quiet as well. That's the other thing about this boat. When we're sailing it, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about the main sheet ram in there, the furling on the mainsail, the furling on the jib, the bow thrusters, the engine, the generator, they're all quieter than pretty much anything I've experienced, certainly on a boat of this size ever before. In some ways, sometimes they're almost too quiet because you're not quite sure whether they're on, but I'd rather have it that way around. Okay, what else? So back here we have uh, a lazarette, which is, I'm not kidding, it's almost big enough to be another cabin. It's huge, it's absolutely vast. And plenty of room in here for warps, fenders, dinghy, anything you like really. I mean it's just plenty of space and it's easy to get to, that's the other thing that I like about it. A nice big hatch, easy to drop down into. Now let's have a look at some of the other detail features that have caught my eye, just a few of them. These lockers underneath the helmsman's seat, very handy indeed, that's got shore power connection in it, that one there, and this one is space for winch handles, blocks, jack lines, the lights, but a very handy, quick stowage, easy to get to, no big drama. Um, cup holders, interesting. You might think it's a small detail, but offshore on a passage, it's a pretty important detail. Easy to get to, nice little cup holders here and here. I like this area a lot because it's very well proportioned. This is a great big solid table here, very, very secure but you can move through easily, no problem at all. But it's also great to brace against when you're going upwind. It's also good if you fancy a little cold drink because it has a fridge in the middle. And again, cup holders this time actually as part of the molding here, putting cups there. So you don't, it's what's been really handy as we've been whizzing around out there, spinning around, taking some shots and the rest of it, is that you can have a cup of tea and then say, yes, we're going to do a tack right now. And you put them straight down into the holders, do the tack, off you go. Small details, but I think important ones. So finally, we have the swim platform. 
this system is a cassette that slides in and out and it's electrically powered and it's a much more efficient way of doing it and it's certainly pretty neat and very easy to use. I'm impressed with that and it's been very useful this week. Sitting at anchor was also the perfect time to take a look behind the scenes below decks where Oyster's Paul Adamson taught me through the systems, starting with the engine room. So we have the N engine here, we have the gearbox. Um, we can see that the raw water inlet, because it's a sail drive, actually comes through the leg of the engine. And so the seacock is literally just lo located there. So any issues, we, we can shut that off and it's straight to hand. Um, here we've got the sea, sea chest that we can look into. This supplies all of the raw water to all of the onboard systems, such as refrigeration, air conditioning, etc. That's all separate, which means um, we have redundancy in the system as well. And we can look straight down into the sea chest and even out of the bottom of the boat just, just to check it's clear. Up here, we've got the Raycor fuel filters. So these are the primary fuel, fuel filters to remove the coarse um, debris out of the fuel. So we've got jet, gen set here and engine here with convenient drip trays for if we're draining the water off here. In, in this space, we've also got the fresh water pump. We've also got the gray water discharge pump as well. And then behind me here, you'll see that these are our two um, uh, sea, sea chests that we can look into to make sure they're clear as well. This, this filters the raw water going into the engine and the generator. We've got the aircon raw water pump here. You'll see all the exhaust system as well and this isn't the only bit of access we've got access in the forward part of the engine room and over from the galley as well and right behind me here through here so i don't know if you can follow me around here but here is our eight kilowatt gen set so again right right to hand i can go through here it's all in there we've got the fire suppression here and we've got all of the controls. This is the central bilge space here. So right at the bottom there, you'll see the black pipes that are coming into a tank there, which has an inspection hatch. And what we've done on this yacht is we've centralized the gray water system, the gray water being all the water from the sinks, the galley sinks, and from the showers as well. Effectively, what happens from all of the sinks and the showers on the boat, um, it flows down into this cent central tank and then in here, there is a rising float switch that effectively, when it gets to a certain level, it then discharges o over the side. Uh, moving over here to starboard, what you'll see here is this is our fuel tank. Um, so here we carry uh, about 900 li litres of fuel. Um, as you can see, the inspection hatches are fantastic. So um, obviously we can check the level of the tank from the Oyster Command system but nothing beats looking through an inspection hatch and seeing the level of the fuel within the tank. There's also a dipstick as well and then here you can see you've got the shutoffs for the fuel as well. If we uh, jump across to port, so, un so under UMAP, this is the water tank here. So capacity of uh, about 650 li litres. Again, you can look directly into the water tank and check the cleanliness of the tank. Um, so what we've done is we've centralised all the weight um, in the right part of the boat, which is over the keel. So finally, under this bilge space here, what we're looking at is we're looking at the hydraulic pumps here for the hydraulic um, Seldon system. So these are the hydraulic pumps that control the in-mast furling, they control the backstay, they control the vang, um, and any of the hydraulics on board. Having put the floorboards back and reassembled the accommodation, it was time to get back underway for our return trip. What was left of the breeze was now dead on the nose. So with our three-day self-imposed deadline in mind, on went the engine. But this was also a perfect opportunity to continue our tests around the catering. And this time, it was our fresco dining. Perhaps unsurprisingly, she passed. This has been the Channel Islands at its best, but it's time to head back and we're currently leaving. Sark behind us there, we have Herm on the other side and we're heading up towards Alderney. We're going to go around the outside of the Casquettes because we haven't really got the timing quite right uh, to go through the Alderney race. No point in punching five or six knots a tide. We're going to go around the outside. Plus, we're also motoring into the breeze, which isn't ideal. But in many ways, 
Anyway, for me, that's the whole point about this boat. You can get places. We've got three knots of tide against us. We've got about nine knots of boat speed. The tide will turn in a few hours and we can punch it and get there and we can crack off and pull out the sails and off we go. But it's so easy to do that. You can just get up and go. And when it comes to changing gear and saying, right, we don't want a motor anymore, you pull out the sails, it's all down to these buttons here. Don't really need to do much else. So she's a very easy boat to cover the miles with. And you can just go and wander and do that three day weekend. And from there, it was on into the night. Well, after more than 200 miles, we're back in the Solent. And what a 200 miles it's been. Fascinating to find out and really get to feel what this boat is like. In fact, last night it was quite quiet on the way back and we decided to go down to just one person on watch last night, which gave us all a bit of time to catch up on sleep. But the thing that it revealed to me was just how workable this cockpit is. And I know I keep going on about it. You feel so secure, it's very protected. You've got great visibility. There's a raised step actually in between the two wheels, which means you can see over the top and forward, which is great for short asses like me. The other thing that's significant about this boat is that this is Oyster's demo boat. And Oyster, like many um, luxury builders, don't do demo boats, but they've decided to with this one. And this has already done 3,000 miles. She's only been in the water a couple of months, but she's done over 3,000 miles and they're feeding back what they're learning into the design as they refine it as the next set of boats come out. And I think that's going to bode extremely well. Not that there's a lot to do on this boat. I made a little list of some of the things that I might like to see. One of them is perhaps some more handholds in the saloon down below in certain areas, and I know they're already thinking about that. Another actually is the boat is so quiet that actually the hydraulic controls and the electric controls for the sail handling systems are so good uh, and so quiet that actually you sort of need some kind of audio warning to remind you what you're doing. It's almost too quiet. But these are small things that can easily be refined. Overall, she's a terrific boat. She never feels, never feels too big, and yet she's got long legs, cruises around at nine knots, and she's been a fantastic boat to be on for three days. Mm -hmm.